Okay, so let's get started. It's 10.30, time for the first session. And we're going to start uh, the first talk with uh, somebody who is, uh, has been a long time in OSM. Since 2007, he has been mapping a lot, uh, developing software. Um, he's been in the board, he's been in the US board, so all the boards there are. He lives in the US now, and he's going to speak uh, about his probably most favorite uh, fam famous project, MapRoulette. Please welcome uh, Marta Infonex. Hi. Uh, my name is Martijn. I'm going to um, talk to you about MapRoulette for 20 minutes. Who around here has used, or who around here knows what MapRoulette is? Okay, that's a, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is, so don't worry if you don't. Uh, I'm going to, it's, it's a project that's now 10 years old. Um, and I don't know who of you here were here for Richard Ferrer's talk before, um, but he's been an even longer, <laughs> longer contributor to OSM than me. So fair warning, there's going to be some um, old guy stuff here to start with because it's a history, right? I'm going to talk about the history of MapRoulette, but also I want to talk about the future. Um, before we do that, though, I wanted to uh, thank everyone involved in this organizing this conference, putting this together. Um, I know it's the first time in three years that we, we, we have been able to get together as a global community. And it's one of my favorite things about, about all of OSM. So um, big thanks to everyone who made it possible to, for us all to be here, the organizers. Um, we got to celebrate the connections that we make here and uh, we got to celebrate OpenStreetMap, right? All right, we have to actually go back a little bit more. We have to go back 14 years <laughs> for for this to, uh, um, for this, for the history of this map roulette to start. So here, in, oh. um, I live in the United States. I've lived there for 12 years now, and um, OpenStreetMap in the United States got really started with um, on a sort of a wild west, um, in a type of a wild west situation. So there was this data set called Tiger. Um, it is a it's road data, but it's it's not it's not particularly accurate. Um, but it's this was in the days when imports were really not fairly regulated yet, so people were kind of just doing it um, in many ways. And uh, it looked kind of like in many places it looked sort of like this, right? So um, there was there was um, a lot of imprecise roads. Um, a lot of stuff that kind of seems just made up as well, <laughs> as you can see here. Um, yeah, and just generally, it was a lot of, there was a lot of stuff to clean up for all of us. And the community was really small at the time, right? Um, so it was a huge task to clean all that up and make it into a road network that resembled something that we could use and even was nice to look at. We want both of those things. So and then, who was around OSM in, in 2012 here? Yeah, um, so you were then, like, you were one of the few lucky ones that were part of the thing that we had called the license change. When we first got started, OSM was licensed, uh, and the data was licensed under a Creative Commons license, which, uh, for the reasons that I will skip over today, uh, was not very suitable for the data that we were building. So after um, a fair amount of debate, we, uh, we, dis we decided to license, change the license to open database license that we know today. Um, this actually made the situation in the US even worse um, because what happened is we needed to contact every single mapper and have them agree with that change. If we couldn't reach them or they didn't agree, their data, their contributions had to be removed. And um, that led to some, a lot of things that were uh, deleted in the United States. Um, these dots. Uh, represent the, the data that was modified and or changed. There's a really interesting blog post. If you get access to the slides later, um, you should read this historic blog post. This is Toby Murray, who is no longer very involved in OSM, but he actually called people up on the phone and he, he introduced himself. Um, Hi, ma'am, I'm from the internet <laughs> and I have a question for you. Um, and that's how he tried to, people, tried to get people to agree. But even so, um, that license change combined, combined with the sort of mess that we already had with the Tiger data led to interesting map art like this. Um, 
a lot of weird artifacts, um, a lot of things that really didn't make any sense anymore uh, um, at all. So well, we weren't too happy with that. I mean, it needs to be it needed to be fixed. So it was really a, quite an enormous cleanup effort that needed to be done with with fairly small community. You know, um, we were at less than a fewer than 100 active mappers at the day in the United States. Um, back then, um, yeah, that was, of course, not very much for a country that is uh, large um, and had all of a sudden tens of millions of roads that nobody had checked. So something was needed to organize uh, that work. And that's how the idea of, of map roulette was, was, was born. It was really conceived as a tool um, to work on small and randomly assigned tasks. And the, the goal with that, the aims were to make this huge mapping effort feel more doable by, make, by breaking it up into, into goals and breaking it up into small tasks. And also by extension to make that repetitive mapping, all that cleanup more fun. So this is what that looked like all the way in the beginning. Um, very simple interface with just a, highlighting a, a thing that needed to be fixed and, and the links to Potlatch, um, that was the editor that we used at the time, uh, or, or uh, Jossum. Um, and that's it. I mean, just fix the thing, mark it, mark it as fixed, and then move on to the next thing. And then that got really addictive, and that actually worked pretty well. So in, in, in four weeks, the small community remapped all the stuff that was destroyed by the license change um, almost entirely, right? So that's that was a pretty big effort. That didn't clean up all of the Tiger um, roads, but it did clean up all the all the things that were destroyed in the in the license change. So that was pretty good. I was I was actually encouraged to do more with that idea, right? Of 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 using small tasks um, to fix big problems over time with the community. Um, so the next thing I looked at was um, roads that were not connected. So roads that are almost connected but not quite. Um, you see one here in real life, uh, but there were a lot of them in OSM, and um, we had seventy thousand of them at that time. And uh, we fixed those in we, like six weeks. Uh, so that, that went pretty well as well. So I thought there's really something here. We got to make more projects like this. It still was a one trick pony, right? I had to reprogram the whole thing to do, uh, to do, to make it do something different. Um, then I did another thing that we called it Zorro ways, um, ways like this that had very strange um, angles. Uh, those got fixed pretty quickly also. And finally, I decided it needed a name, right? It needed a name and it needed um, to be more flexible. So um, instead of the map in, in Portland, um, I sort of announced that the, the next generation of it, that anyone could create tasks, right? That was my goal for it. It was not just me reprogramming the whole thing all the time, but actually, um, but actually uh, letting, let, giving the power to the community to create, um, to create the tasks themselves. Uh, so, that's a little bit of history. I'm, I'm going to fast forward to today now because like everything that happened in between was basically led to what MapRel is today um, with a long sort of, sort of incremental development and interface changes. Um, so the, the original goal hasn't really changed. It's still a tool that makes repetitive mapping more fun and brings the community together to work on, a, to work on specific tasks. Um, and it's and it's used quite a bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but first, I'm going to just kind of summarize what MapRelate can do today, what you can do with it. Um, so anyone can create challenges. Challenges are groups of tasks that have the same sort of question, right? Um, it's available in 17 languages. Anyone can help translate. That's uh, happening in the open uh, with uh, TransFX, which I think is the tool that a lot of OSM uh, applications use to uh, to translate. Um, it has review functions, so if one person solves the task, someone else can review it. That's probably, if you know Tasking Manager, it's very similar to that, but then just with one task. Um, it has a, an open API that anyone can use to create tasks, to retrieve them, to integrate them in other applications. Um, it has pretty good, if I say so much, well, with the help of a lot of people, it, it, um, it, has, a lot, it has pretty good documentation and learning resources now. There's a lot of talks that I did in the past that are still online. There's also the, the Learn learn.maprelate.org website that I'll link to in the end. Um, and then we have um, a few different challenge 
types that were not there in the beginning. So the original challenge type was just basically, I'll show you this situation, go into, go into uh, JOSM or ID, um, fix it, come back, and go on to the next one. So today we have three more challenge types. Um, we have the virtual challenges, we have uh, tag fixes, and we have cooperatives. And it's kind of up to how much time I have to how, how much I go into these, but I think I do have time, so let's do it. So first off, virtual challenge. This is basically a way for every for anyone to go into MapRoulet, find tasks that they're interested in, and then make a mini challenge out of them, right? So if you have, for example, a challenge that covers the entire world, there's a few of those, but you only want to work on a small area, you can just draw that on the map and um, and create your own virtual challenge that you can do by yourself or that you can share with uh, with, for example, with a mapping uh, with a mapping party or social event. Um, so you can just kind of create a smaller challenge you can that gets your your own challenge link and that you can then use to to share with your own local group or your uh, or your uh, your social event if you have a mapping party or whatever. So taking it a step further is the is the what we call the quick fix or tag fix challenges. This one these ones have tag changes already baked in, right? So you don't even have to go to Potlatch or <laughs> uh, ID or or Jossum, um to 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 create, to change the tags, but um, it's right there in in in, um, in MapRoulette, and you can just um, look at the changes that are proposed and click one button to fix them in OSM. And this is great for sort of manually reviewing tags that are considered outdated. Um, so here's one uh, here's one that that updates a lot of tags from uh, to be more specific from tunnel equals yes to tunnel equals building passage for select. Uh, for select um, uh, for select sort of tunnel type features in in Poland, the uh, example that you see here, um, yeah. So those are the those are the quick fix challenges. So tags only. Taking it even one step further is the is the cooperative challenge, which basically have entire change sets already baked into them. So these are great for if you have data from elsewhere that is licensed appropriately, you can then go in and make tasks out of each of them. Say building footprints. Uh, or points of interest um, that are from approved external sources, and you don't like you don't want to really like importing is sometimes good, but most of the time is really not. Um, but this is kind of a, a an intermediate way. You have a lot of external data that you somehow want to get into OSM. And you have humans review each and every uh, feature and uh, and have them added. And this only works in Jossum because Jossum lets you create a different layer with the additional data. You can merge it with uh, with the data layer. And then add it. So it's kind of a little bit of a process. I'm happy to talk about it more in detail. This uh, 20 minutes I have um, doesn't really doesn't really uh, allow me to sort of go into a, a bunch of detail. But I'm happy to show you it uh, afterwards how that works. It's it's a pretty powerful um, uh, way to sort of yeah gently ease new data into OSM and without sort of um, blindly importing it, which is like I said mostly um, with exceptions and not a good idea. Um, yeah, this is just sort of showing that in a little bit more detail. So that's a little bit of an overview of what MapRoulette can do today. Um, I wanted to spend a couple minutes on giving a few examples of what, what communities locally, what people have done with, uh, with MapRoulette so far and recently. Um, one of them, like the Philippines community, who's here from the Philippines? Oh. Um, is a really um, is a really um, power user of, of MapRoulette. One of the things that they did is um, they had school data from from 40,000 locations, and they used MapRoulette to successfully uh, improve the, the 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 public school data uh, in the, in the Philippines in a matter of I think it was a few months uh, that that project ran, and they did it all through MapRoulette. And you can see here that it was completed at the time I took the screenshot. Uh, that was a few months ago. Um, and it's like you see here the overview of the of the challenge that everyone can see, right? So if you go to the challenge page, if you find it on um, on, on mapRoulette.org, you see the um, you see the the, um, uh, the map of where how the tasks are distributed, and then you see the um, you see the the progress as well uh, in numbers and also in a little bar bar chart. Another interesting one, I think, is the the um, the map completion projects that uh, that the Belgian community did. I think I always noticed a few people from from Belgium there. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, what's this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Continue. Um, so there's a lot of um, there's a few projects to do with roads, but also more recently to do with uh, with with uh, various sort of ag agricultural land use um, that were that that was compared between between OSM and 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 other um, and uh, and uh, government data sources. Um, these are fairly small projects, but still important. You know, it's a, it's a good way to to help communities really inspect uh, external data compared with OSM, and then really think about okay, what is Okay, that was Belgium. Um, great, great users of, of MapRelate, and also all these people have given me great feedback as well. The things that they would like to see improve, right? So that's that's been great too. Um, a lot of MapRelate users um, put issues in on GitHub. Um, the, the the Philippines, uh, some people from the Philippines, they seem to file issues every week, even, <laughs> which is fine. We look at all, and most of them are good. Uh, so the last one I wanted to highlight is a more recent one. Um, there's a there's a project going on in Berlin um, to uh, to improve sort of the mapping of of, of, of the sort of the public parking. Um, apparently, the city of Berlin is doing a big um, sort of project around sort of the future of parking in the city, and they they're creating all these little parklets that are just basically just these little tiny little things that take up one or two parking spaces and just public spaces for people to sit instead. Um, and there's data available for it, and they're trying to uh, together with uh, with mapillary imagery. You see here that um, they verify based on very recent mapillary imagery uh, if that parklet indeed exists and then it can be added to OSM. I don't know, I have no idea what the tags for these are, but you can add them apparently. So that was Berlin. So those were just a few examples of how communities have used have used MapRoulet, right? And you can use it for anything you can imagine that is that is that is kind of similarly task based. So a little bit about uh, what I think about the future, and here's where I, where I really want to rely on you guys. Um, where is MapRoulette going next? What do you want to see? Right? It's an open source project, of course. Um, there's a there's a bunch of things that that are already on the on the on the on the future development list. I have some ideas of my own that I'll just share with you here. But there's a bunch of ideas out there from people who've used it, and even people who haven't used it yet. So I want to hear your thoughts about that too. So I want to do more integrations with other apps, right? Right now we have some integration with some, it's a little bit painful because of technical reasons that I haven't solved. Um, but there's a bunch of opportunities, right? Especially with apps that are that let you edit uh, on the ground, like Street Complete, uh, GoMap, all those different apps um, that you use on your phone, because like there can be tasks that only people on the ground can solve, right? There's a lot of those. And that's still my favorite way to map is just kind of walk around and solve things. Um, but also desktop-based applications. So the API is there, but it's just a little cumbersome still. Um, and um, and also we, have, we already have a flag that lets you set, okay, local knowledge is required, uh, which would be a good filter for people who want to use it in a mobile integration. So there's some stuff already there, but it needs to be improved. And I think there's plenty of good mobile apps. There doesn't need to be a MapRoulette mobile app per se, I think, but that integration could be really powerful. Okay, here's the Vespucci integration that's already there. Uh, once you have it going, it works. It works well, but you have to kind of insert an API key, and it's uh, Simon has been complaining about about that to me for years, and rightfully so. Um, so the other thing is, um, so there's two parties to a MapRoulette contract, right? There's the first pe the person who makes the challenge, the mapper who makes the challenge, creates the task, and then there's the mappers who solve them. So how do you um, how do you uh, how do you bring those two together? There's already some tools to message back and forth, but um, I would like that to be better and make also challenge makers more accountable, right? So right now, for example, challenges are being uh, automatically archived if they've been ignored by the by the maker for six for six months. Um, and uh, but there's going to be there has to be more accountability to make sure that the challenges and the tasks that are there are good and good for mappers to to work on. Um, finally, like better discovery, um, there's already search and filters that are pretty good. But it could be it could it could still be I think a lot better, and then uh, also what I call the task life cycle. Uh, like, how do you go from a created task to one that is complete? There's different statuses that you can that you can that you can um, um, check for a task as you do it. But it's um, it's still quite confusing, and I think um, it is confusing. Uh, so we need to think about that. Uh, there's a big ticket on discussion on GitHub about that uh, that I would love your input on. 
So how can we make that less confusing and more and more um, yeah easier for people to understand? Oh, yeah, that was it. Okay, cool. I was I stayed within my 20, 20 minutes ish. Um, so again, I'd love to hear your ideas. And if you want to have a demo, like find me somewhere. I don't have a computer with me, but if you have your own, then I'll happy happily demo demo it. Um, you can reach me um, at the at the, these Twitter things. Um, I'm also pretty easy to find on the internet. Uh, and here's the learn.maproulette.org website. So this has everything you need to learn how to do all kinds of things with Maproulette, from basically solving tasks to also creating tasks and and everything around it, using the API, all those things. So thanks again. Um, I I love your feedback and um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. We're only just getting started. Mm -hmm. share the mic. Oh, okay. You first. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, I fondly remember Maprolet being useful for getting rid of old style multi polygons. That was <laughs> that was quite a challenge. So we have a couple of questions. Um, one of the question was um, about the quick fix challenge. So there was a mapper who happily used this, but got into trouble. Uh, for fixing the text uh, according to ID suggestions with other local methods, mm -hmm. who wanted to do it differently? So, what do you suggest? Yeah, so that's um, so. There's very few limitations on what you can put in, right? So, it's the responsibility of the task maker to make sure that they, like with any like with any mapping project, that you consult with the local community. So, like I said, there there needs to be more accountability between the challenge makers and the person and the people who create the task and the community that it, the community that it affects, right? So I think what's important is um, that we let people know that MapRoulette is responsible, quote unquote, for certain change sets. And we already do that through the MapRoulette hashtag and we actually link back to the challenge. So that line of communication sort of already exists. In the end, like I don't want to limit, um, I don't want to sort of put up too many barriers, but at the same time, I want to make sure that, um, that, that the people who make the challenges are aware of the responsibility that they carry for the changes that, uh, that they have people make. So good instructions, uh, being easy to reach. So that, that's that's um, that's what I want to improve if, to make that to make that less of an issue in the future. Good question. Where do those questions come from? They come from our online viewers or. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you you can also use the venue list to ask questions. So uh, another question is photo mapping. That's very uh, popular. Any plans to integrate it? Yeah, actually, we made a little prototype of um, uh, um, of sort of a photo mapping integration. You can already um, integrate map layer layer in MapRoulette, um, so that's one thing. Um, but there is a we did a, we did a little um, prototype project that basically lets you upload geotag photos and it makes a challenge out of it. Um, so that's something that's been on my mind for a while. I'd love to ha I'd love to have some help implementing that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I, it's a I, I want it too. I yeah. want it too. <laughs> this phone says the future. And the final question, uh, how might we make collaborative tasks work outside JOSM? Yeah, that's, uh, um, I think that, um, I think that requires some, perhaps some work on the, on the ID side, because you'll have to, basically what we happen is we send the change set to JOSM, right? They have the, the remote control uh, API for that, and you can send changes to JOSM. I don't know. Like the last time I looked, I, with ID you couldn't do that um, because it just, yeah, it just it's not built that way. Um, I would love to see it more available outside of Jossum because I realize that, um, of, in terms of percentage of mappers, uh, Jossum is in the minority, um, and most people would, most people prefer ID in numbers. Um, but it'll have to. There's still an open ticket for it. It's not trivial, but um, and it probably will require some work on the ID side. But yeah. Let's hope that works. Mm -hmm. Let's hope we can make that work in the Martin, future. Martin, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, I need to talk to him. That's a good. That's a good. Good point. So we would have time for one more question from the audience. If somebody has a question. Janet, up there. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I wonder. I saw the um, schools mapping. Um, I wondered if you'd had any um, conversations with Giga, um, UNICEF, who have got this 
um, programme to map every school um, and whether you think a uh, map roulette could potentially be used for something like that? Not yes, I just heard about it this morning um, and I need to have that conversation. Is anyone here? Uh, is anyone around who can talk to about that? Right. Um, I can talk about Tanzania. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it sounds like a good use case. We should talk about it, Janet. Thanks. Okay. Thanks again, Matan. Mm -hmm. Thank you.